Hey guys, Mr. Klein here, and we're in my classroom today because we're going to be talking about a geologic topic that's just a bit too big and far away to actually go on location for. So today we're going to be talking about a component of continents that isn't actually talked about all that much in geology textbooks. I mean, after all, this is the extent of books that I could find that included enough information on the topic. So today we're going to be talking about continental shields and what they tell us about the continents themselves. So when I was a kid, looking at physical maps of North America, there was always one thing that caught my eye because it sounded like it really didn't belong on a map. So to the seven-year-old Mr. Klein, the Rocky Mountains, the Missouri River, the Gulf Coastal Plain made sense, but the Canadian Shield? What the heck was that? Well, the term shield refers to a specific type of crust found on continents. The Austrian geologist Edward Seuss, not related to the good doctor that is, first identified shields as an important volume of geology called Face of the Earth, or Das Antlitz der Erde, in his native German, I think. Seuss identified much of northern Canada as a Canadian shield, and he said the entire formation looked, quote, not unlike a flat shield, and the name stuck. So actually understanding what shields are requires a deep dive, literally, to the structure of continents. So if you remember middle school science, Earth's crust is divided into several chunks called plates that move around slowly, generally about as fast as your fingernails grow. So where these plates meet, you have all sorts of interesting things going on. So where they're moving away from each other, new crust forms as the magma comes from the mantle up to the surface. At the other end, crust from one plate can slide through another one through a process called subduction and return to the mantle. If the collision occurs between two pieces of land, mountain ranges then fold up and form. The rocks that make up these plates can be divided into two broad categories. So the first, the oceanic crust, is the material under the oceans, and it's quite dense and made of cooled magma that it's come up from the mantle. The rest, all the land on Earth's surface, the ground and shallow seabeds of the continental shelf, is less dense and is known as continental crust. So continental crust is actually much thicker than the oceanic crust. On average, it's almost 10 times as thick and consists of all the types of rocks you know, love, and memorize for a science test once upon a time and forgot about about an hour after the test. The core of continental plates is known as a craton, and that's where the crust is the thickest yet least dense, which is really an ideal base to build a continent that's going to float on top of the denser mantle. Until the 1970s, geologists and the average person had the same opinion about these rocks. They were extremely boring and not worth much consideration. However, in the 1970s, Professor Thomas Jordan from Princeton University came up with the idea that the process that created the continental cratons was different than the plate tectonic processes we see today. And so that meant that their properties would be different as well. So essentially, cratons differ from more modern crust in that because the mantle was way hotter billions of years ago, the minerals created would be lighter in density than if they were made at lower temperatures. Also, hotter mantle meant that the convection currents that drive plate movement would be much faster. That would result in the plates colliding far more often than today, almost kneading the crust like dough. The result of this would mean not only tall mountain ranges where they collided, but also deeper into to the mantle they would get pushed into in order to make the craton more stable and move slowly. As time went on and the mantle cooled, more plates collided with the craton and they remained stuck together and the continents that we know about today began to truly form. Cratons are mostly underground due to hundreds of millions of years of slow and steady weathering, removing rock material and placing layers of sedimentary rock on top of them. The part of the craton that's below the sedimentary layer of rocks is known as a platform. So there's plenty of places where these same processes that remove the rock material just left the craton exposed at the surface. However, there's only a few of these exposed cratons that are large enough to be classified on their own. And these regions of the craton are known as shields. There's over a dozen shields worldwide, with at least one on every continent. As Seuss described, shields are generally flat with gently rolling terrain and range from the jungles of the Guinea Shield in South America, the open lands of the Indian Shield on the Indian subcontinent, the sandy deserts of the Arabian Shield, and the bare conifer-dotted landscapes of the Baltic and Canadian Shields. Shields offer us our only direct evidence to what Earth's surface was like hundreds of millions and even billions of years ago. And the Canadian Shield does this in particular due to the relatively bare landscape. Over the last several glacial periods, the Canadian Shield was covered in the Laurentian Ice Sheet, which was a massive continental glacier up to two miles thick in spots, which while it wasn't burying modern day metropoles like Boston and Chicago or carving out the Great Lakes, it was scouring the Canadian Shield of most of the overlying sediment and giving it its current textbook post-glacial terrain of moraines, kettle lakes, and drumlins. 
not to mention the soggy permafrosted tundra in its northernmost reaches. So when you look at the rocks that are exposed in the shield, you see huge expanses of igneous and metamorphic rocks that are more than 550 million years old. That's a time period geologists refer to as Precambrian time. In fact, according to one paper I was doing my research on, the Canadian Shield contains 84% of the existing crust that separated from the mantle before 2.5 billion years ago. In fact, the Canadian Shield is made of mostly igneous and metamorphic rocks that exist in large bands with areas in between called greenstone belts. Greenstone belts consist of a wide variety of rocks with low silica content and contain minerals that give these rocks a shade of, well, green. And these rocks are really important for reasons that I'm going to explain in a minute. So since shields are so old, it makes sense that we find the oldest rocks on Earth there. So we found the oldest mineral grains in the Australian shield, and then there's considerable debate over whether the oldest rock formation is in Australia or in the East Antarctic Shield, or in one of several places in the Canadian Shield. Of course, when we're talking about rocks billions of years old, any age that's given has to be taken with a grain of salt. The reason being is the margin of error on these dates is often in the millions of years. So it makes sense that if shields have the oldest rocks, then they would also provide evidence of the first continental plates as well. So like I mentioned earlier, different tectonic processes resulted in tectonic plates far smaller than the ones around today. We see these protoplates in the forms of the large igneous and metamorphic rock formations that make up much of the shield formations worldwide. However, in between these protoplates are the menagerie of rocks that make up greenstone belts. And that's where we learn a lot about what Earth's surface was actually like billions of years ago. Greenstone belts are generally considered by geologists to have started out as ocean floor, then through plate movement were subducted, collided, and created a wide variety of landforms, just like we see on Earth's surface today. So for instance, in the Canadian Shield, we see evidence of volcanic island arcs that resemble portions of modern-day Japan. And the Kapval Craton in South Africa shows evidence of billion-year-old alluvial fans. In Western Australia, we not only see evidence of alluvial fans, but also the bottoms of ancient lakes, braided river terrain, and even large deltaic formations from rivers. Craziest of all, green belts show worldwide the evidence of long-vanished mountain chains, some of which were estimated to have been even taller than the present-day Himalayas. And all of this doesn't even mention all the evidence of widespread volcanic activity all over the place. In short, greenstone belts show that even billions of years ago, geologic processes on Earth operated much like they do even today. So while geologists get all giddy about greenstones, granites, and granulites, and shields and cratons, probably the most practical knowledge about shields actually comes from the fact that they're a major source of mineral resources. So whenever you think of countries with a wealth of mineral ore resources, like for instance, Russia, Canada, Australia, China, Brazil, the Democratic Republic of Congo, you realize that much of this wealth actually comes from mining mineral ores from the shield regions that are located there. Mineral ores are created through a wide variety of geologic processes generally related to tectonic plate movement and interaction. So since shields have evidence of these in abundance, it really does make sense that these regions would be exploited for their natural resource wealth. So for instance, in the Canadian Shield, there's plenty of copper, gold, nickel, and silver. Australia's place as a global leader in extracting aluminum and uranium, opal, and rare earth elements are a result of mining the exposed cratons of Western Australia. Also, no matter the Precambrian Shield, you're going to find huge iron deposits, as you can see in the list of largest producers of iron in the world. So so you may you notice that the United States is there, and that's because the remaining iron mines open in the United States are in the states of, well, Michigan and Minnesota, where, you guessed it, a branch of the Canadian shield breaks the surface there. So there you go. Determining what a shield actually is leads us down a really, really deep rabbit hole into not just what exactly makes up a continent, but also deep into Earth's history in order to find out the oldest rocks, the oldest rock formations, and also see just how landforms we see today were present billions of years ago thanks to the same process that shape our world today. After all, here in Louisiana, you'd have to drill down nearly 40,000 feet or 12 kilometers to reach similar rock layers that what you would see in Canada thanks to all the sedimentation through the Mississippi River and its ancestors. So if you're in Canada, Australia, South Africa, Scandinavia, or somewhere else where there's exposed Precambrian rocks on the surface, Go ahead and pick up a rock and 
ponder about when it was made and all the things it's seen over the years and may well see into the future. So this has been an episode of Phenomenon Explained, a series of videos that helps to explain why things happen in the world around us. This video aligns to both the Louisiana Student Standards for Science as well as the Next Generation Science Standards. So this video covers 8-MS-ESS2-3, which discusses the evidence that is used for the theory of plate tectonics, as well as 8-MS-ESS2-2, which talks about the cycling of rocks materials throughout or surface over time. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more content like this, make sure to subscribe to this channel and make sure you as well click on the bell icon in order to get notifications. So if you've got any questions, please put them in the comments below and thanks for watching.